Hey, KU fans, welcome back to the KU Sports Hour here at KUSports.com. I'm Matt Tate, and I'm here to uh, talk about Kansas basketball. We haven't done it in a little while, and the reason is we've been busy covering Kansas basketball. The guy on your screen with me has been a big part of that. His name is Zach Boyer. You've surely read his stuff by now. Zach came along at a pretty good time to write some pretty cool stuff. So we're going to talk to Zach about this whole Kansas run, but real quick, we're going to let him introduce himself. Zach, say hello to your new friends. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, and I'll say, you know, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm Zach Boyer. Uh, as Matt just mentioned, I joined the Journal World back in mid-January. Uh, my first assignment was the Kansas State game away at Kansas State. So my season was bookended by uh, massive halftime comebacks, uh, but it's been great to be a part of this ride. Uh, it's been uh, almost 10 years since I've covered college basketball, so getting reacclimated to the modern, uh, let's say the evolving world of new NCAA regulations and non-regulations has been interesting, uh, but it's been, it's been fun to see, you know, watching this team from afar, uh, what has happened now uh, going forward, because when I first was watching them, I thought, okay, this is a pretty good college basketball team. And then as we now know, a couple of days later, uh, this is a national championship basketball team. So uh, my impressions were certainly reinforced. Uh, there were some, some down moments, I think, uh, being part of this group, uh, covering this team for, for the last, uh, what now, nine weeks, I guess. Uh, you know, you look at the Kentucky game, you look at that, that Baylor game away, and you look at some pretty big losses and you think, okay, that's fine. Teams can take their lumps, but my impression was always that uh, they were a pretty good team that could make some noise. And I think they made the loudest noise of all uh, come Monday night. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, and we'll, we'll get into the tournament here because that's the, the run everybody wants to talk about specifically last week in New Orleans. Um, but, but I am curious, you know, while we're doing this introduction thing, first off, Zach's from Connecticut. So he's not a, a Kansas guy. He's not a KU guy. He's fresh blood, fresh eyes, all that stuff. And we're super happy about that. Um, but, but, Going back before the tournament, and I don't want you to pinpoint a game or anything, you know, maybe even a play, uh, nothing like that. But just what what was your thought about this team as they as they rolled? You said they were pretty good. I mean, did you ever have any thoughts that they could make a run like this? I mean, obviously, when you're Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, you can do it every year um, or any year. But it doesn't happen every year. So uh, what, what was the the sort of feeling out process like for you as you did kind of learn about this team and, and cover them a little bit and, and you got to be around them. I mean, how, how long did it take you to realize, man, maybe they could do something special or did you realize that when we got to new Orleans? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I don't think there was any, any real moment when I thought they could do something special, right. You just continually saw a really high level of excellence from, from the team for, for much of the year. And, and I think like you mentioned, right, a team that's Kentucky, a team that's Duke, even as we just saw a team that's North Carolina with Carolina across their chests, that kind of pushes them to another level where there's always something possible, no matter how well they may not be playing. Um, but I think for me, you know, you see so many of these teams in the past, and I'm not just talking about Kansas and talking about a lot of these, these top programs where they do have years where they're considered to be pretty good and something wacky happens and they flame out. I mean, look at last year, right? I thought last year Kansas was pretty good and then just happened to have the situations it had with the illnesses and the injuries in the tournament and were knocked out in the second round fairly emphatically by USC, right? You can have a good team and just lose games. And that's exactly what happened to Kentucky this year. Um, so I think those expectations, right. That's, that's not always a guarantee of success, but I think when you wear one of those names across your chest, there's always this expectation that something more is always going to be possible just because you're getting that high level of player. You're getting that level of player that can figure it out. I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, just in our own conversations, these guys definitely figured it out because they got their roles together late in the season. They knew what was expected of each person. Yeah. And I think that's what really helped them. Um, so I wouldn't say to your original question, there was a, a moment when I said, this is a really good team. I was always just kind of impressed by their physicality, their size. We've been, we've had the conversations about athleticism, but I thought they've been a fairly athletic team. Um, certainly not to the degree that Kentucky was when they ran them off the court. Right. But they looked like one of the creams of the crop from the first time I saw them. And so I didn't think national championship was 
possible possible, but I didn't think it was out of the question, you know, after those first couple of games of watching them. Yeah, let's have a little fun because we only get to do this introduction thing one time. So um, and then we'll get into the tournament run and, and all of those things that are just so remarkable about this team that obviously will be remembered forever. Um, mm-hmm. But if, if you're uh, if you're talking to some Connecticut friends of yours that don't know much about Kansas basketball and they ask you to describe it, what is Kansas basketball? I mean, quickly, you don't have to go into it deeply, but but what, what do you tell them? I mean, now that you've experienced it a little bit and seen behind the scenes and some of that stuff, I mean, what, what is Kansas basketball, Zach? Yeah, I think it's it's excellence, it's pride, um, it's history, it's tradition. Um, you know, we hear culture a lot. How many times did we hear culture, you know, yeah. mentioned the last yeah. like three weeks? And I think culture sometimes is overrated because one or two bad apples can spoil the bunch, right? But, you know, all those players have said that they've liked each other and they've appreciated each other. So I would say it's basically that. It's just kind of an understanding that when you're when you're stepping foot in that arena, playing a game in the field house court and you're looking up with those names in the rafters. There's not very many places that can do that. So there's a high standard and a high reputation to uphold. And I think that's what I would tell people is this is a place where people come to play if they want to play, obviously in one of the most hollowed grounds there is in the sport. And, and that is a certain level of pressure that you do not get very many other places. Yeah, that's well said. Um, I, I want to explain to people too, Zach came in and, and uh, I mean, midseason, as he mentioned, January and, and January 22nd was that K-State game. Mm-hmm. And, and we're kind of on the fly trying to figure out that, how to cover this season, trying to figure out how Zach works, how we work together, um, what what the right roles are and all that stuff. And we're still figuring some of that out. But this <laughs> run gave us a little extra opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, but one of the coolest things about Zach, in my opinion, was he came in and, and his first press conference he went to, he's asking questions. And that's because he explained to me that a lot of guys will come just sit and, you know, cherry pick quotes and just sit there and not ask any questions and then write the best stuff. And, and Zach uh, has a has a high standard for himself, has a high standard for us and, and at least believes that if you're going to jump in and, and write about something that you're at, you should participate. And I always thought that was so cool because I believe that throughout my career. Um, and so it was a great fit. And, and it also gave him an opportunity to jump right in. And, and so. I, I say that I introduce that by, or I, I, I kind of introduce this next question that way, because I want to, I want to ask you your impressions of Bill Self. Um, and again, your first presser with him, you're asking him a question. He had met you. We had had a chance to pull him aside in the hall a day or two before the presser, but um, you know, he, he didn't know you by any means. Right. right. So he, he does now. And uh, you've been around him for a, a heck of a run and one of the best and most important runs of his entire career um, so what is your what is your impression of him? What was your first impression and 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 what did you learn about self as as you kind of covered this team and continued to be around him and them and and uh, same sort of thing, right? What would you tell people about Kansas? What 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 would you tell people about Bill Self and, and covering a self team? Yeah, Matt, I think you know, I'm always maybe it's the journalist in me that's a little bit cynical of, of venerating the people that were around, right? Because what we see is a very manicured put forth personality of somebody that that they have decided to craft in a certain way. We don't know them to their core necessarily like anybody else in their personal life does. Um, That being said, I've had a couple of friends who are familiar with with Bill Self from previous stops. Um, One of them uh, was a, a KU student who had covered him many years ago. And he had always said that he's one of the most genuine guys he's ever dealt with in the media. And I don't know necessarily, you know, the scope of what that might mean to him. But what I've seen so far in those interactions is that he doesn't seem to take himself super seriously. Um, I think he understands uh, what he's saying, certainly, and what he's about. But I don't think he's necessarily the kind of person who is going to chastise the media. I've been around plenty of those people who will take a press conference question and then light you up on the spot. And that's not ever a good situation. Um, I have no doubt. Um, that he's you know, willing to have those conversations with you off camera, off mic in private moments. And that's great. And I think those are always good learning situations for anybody. Um, but I think basically with him, it seems like the public persona is a bit closer to what his private persona might be. And that he, he does seem like, you know, kind of one of those, um, you know, a down to earth type of people who's, who's relatable. And he's, how many times has he had, and I know for you, I mean, countless times, right. But how many times even this season has somebody asked him a question and he's spun a yarn about some 
classic recruiting tale or some, you know, even his coaching journey last, last week, I think came up um, how he got his first job. And he has a very folksy way of telling these stories, which I think is always endearing. So um, you get coaches, I think, you know, I, I or really early in my career, I covered Jim Calhoun, right. Which he was a, a different breed of, of animal. Um, he was not afraid to eviscerate you in any setting, whether it's public or, you know, one-on-one or on the phone or, you know, one of those get up close in your face and the spittle's flying and you're just like, oh, dear goodness, you know. Um, and I don't think Bill has that kind of a gene. I think you can see from the way he coaches games that he can be stern and, and very uh, maybe even heavy handed and sometimes with the criticism that he levels. But I think that he might mean it better than a lot of other coaches do um, because you see and you know the modern age of coaching is really about embracing and not being so critical and certainly Bob Knight's not going to throw a chair anymore. Right. So yeah, these right. things don't happen, but I think from, from, from seeing him, um, I think it's, it's as close to what you see as what you get as possible so far. And I'm not saying again, with the caveat that, you know, there could be more to his character and there is certainly more to his character that I haven't seen. Um, but he does seem almost as presented and as, as, uh, as his persona carries. Yeah. Well said that that's a cool perspective and, and uh, awfully true. So um, you'll learn more uh, just as you will about Lance Leipold and football. Uh, Zach's going to be handling the, the point on our football coverage from here on out. And uh, a lot of, a lot of fun to ha- be had there potentially too. So uh, good time to jump in. You get a, you get a national championship run right away. And then uh, the football climb is what believe people believe is happening. So um, as we kind of continue to move forward and now that we have a time to kind of take our, take our inventory and catch our breaths and things like that, we're going to figure out what to do with this podcast so that it's back regularly and weekly and more entertaining than just these two heads right here talking to you. So, um, we've got some time in the off season to figure that out and we will, and we're working on it and it's, uh, it's going to be back, but for now, let's get into it, man. Let's, let's get into, uh, all the fun, all the run, all the things that, People in this town and and Kansas fans all over the country and the world can't stop talking about, and that's what happened Monday night. Um, First question, who's the MOP of that tournament? In your opinion, I don't know if you voted. I did, but um, it's tough on deadline, and and things are flying there in the the Superdome. Sometimes you don't know how the game's going to go. Obviously, that was the case here, so um, I I don't think a ton of people vote every year, but... um, but either way, it doesn't matter. Who 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 would you have voted for if you didn't? And who did you vote for if you did? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one classic story. It's probably the first time in my life I've missed deadline because they said you had to submit your ballot with two minutes left. And I clicked submit and I looked up at the game clock and it said 155. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> it must not have counted. I got the confirmation, though, that it did. Um, you know, I wish I could. I wish I could remember. I, I definitely voted. I wish I could remember how I voted. I think. I believe I told you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe I voted Remy Martin as the most outstanding player. Um, And I did that because at that time of the game, that's when he was knocking down those shots and the momentum had been carrying. And I thought for sure it would have carried out the last two minutes. As we saw the last two minutes, obviously, uh, probably the most deserving, most outstanding player, David McCormick, was the one who finished that thing off in in grand style. And, And I don't disagree in the slightest bit. Uh, when what when Bill Self had said that you know Ochai Abaji can have the trophy, but here's the net because it's yeah, only more yeah, very that, cool. Right? Um, so I, I don't disagree at all that McCormick should have been the most outstanding player. Um, he really put that team on his back those last two games. The, I think also what gets lost in it is it's the most outstanding player of the tournament and not the Final Four. So to me, I think Remy Martin because of the performances he had earlier in the tournament, uh, 23 points and 20 points and 15 points that they they probably win those games without him but they don't win those games without him if you know what I mean because he came up so big in in crucial moments so that was that was important for him but I think there's no denying uh, McCormick was the one who who really carried them in those last two those last two games what did you do what did you put on your ballot yeah I voted for McCormick um and 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 I had Remy on the all tournament team of course and 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 to your point I mean Remy was the MVP of the Midwest Regional so he's got this, this body of work leading into that. And, and he didn't do anything against Villanova and that's probably what killed him. Um, but they didn't need him to, you know, and, and again, we're, we're going to be talking about this team for the rest of time. And, and when you do look back at this team, what you're going to remember, what you're going to talk about, of course, some of the individual players and moments and plays and things like that, but 
I, I think you'll always remember, people will always remember that this was a team. And, and so unlike most teams, this, this made it hard, right? I mean, if, if you go look at their production throughout the tournament, throughout the final four, um, it, it was always, it's pretty close. The rebounding and the point totals are pretty close. It's, it's not, you know, a clear case of a, Nan, a Danny Manning that just carried a team throughout the run yeah. or anything like that. So I, I think that's what made it hard. I mean, I was sitting there during the championship game courtside and, and I'm, I think three or four times I was sitting next to Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell. And I think three or four times we, we leaned over to each other and we're like, Oh, I think it's Remy now. Oh, I, I think it's Dave now, you know, and Oh, it could be Christian. I mean, look, you know, and, So the fact that you couldn't pinpoint who the MOP was until the very, very end, Mm -hmm. I think is is the perfect way to to kind of encapsulate what this team was and and who they were and and who they are. So um, I voted for Dave, though, and I voted for Dave because he was great against Villanova um, and, and on a pretty big stage, but also... Man, in that championship game, the difference between Kansas when Dave was on the floor and Kansas when he was off the floor was startling. I mean, like they had no chance with Dave out of the lineup. And then when he was on the floor, they looked pretty darn good. They looked like a team that could win it all. But boy, you know, more than any individual player. And, and, and you know, it's easy to say that because a guy like Christian Brown didn't come off the floor. So we don't know what he looked right. like or what, yeah. what Carolina looked like against a, uh, a Kansas team that didn't have CB out there, you know. And, and I'm not saying he would have been in the mix. He probably was the lowest on the list of those guys we mentioned. Um, but, but, you know, for me, it was, just, it was just so obvious that Dave was the, the biggest piece of that thing. And that doesn't mean he was the only piece, but – um, in terms of taking one guy away or, or having him and not having him, uh, it was night and day and, and he had to deliver if he hadn't, they wouldn't have won. And, uh, they, you know, they may not have even won against Villanova. I mean, Ochai was amazing in that game and they got off to the big lead, but without Dave doing what he did in inside against the Wildcats there, I mean, that was important as that team ended up cutting it to six points late in the Mm -hmm. game and that kind of thing. So, um, to me that, that just seems so, so evident. And, and it, it is a little bit of, I don't know that you call it recency bias, but it is a little bit of, uh, you know, what's the latest thing you've seen. And, and that's a big part of it. Um, but I would not have argued with Remy. Um, I thought Ochai was a little bit of a lazy pick. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people who voted obviously enough voted for Ochai. They probably thought, well, he was great against Villanova. I saw that with my own eyes. And then, oh, yeah, he was an All-American. He was their leader. He was a Big 12 player of the year. Makes sense. You know, and that's well, And fine. then you also have to remember that half the people voting are people who follow North Carolina, right? So they're sure. not familiar enough with the nuances of that run to make a more educated decision. And there's nothing wrong with Ochai, like you mentioned. Like, he didn't have the greatest tournament. But, yeah, I would say a lazy pick is just probably – is probably a really good way to put it. Yeah, and it's not that he didn't deserve it. I mean, he Correct. was – the face of that team from Madison Square Garden in November all the way through crying with his mom and dad after the confetti fell. I mean, he Mm -hmm. was the face of this team. Doesn't mean he was this team. Um, But there were times, and I wrote about this in our special special section. That's hard to say. Um, (laughs) I, I wrote about this for our special section. There it was again. I wrote about this for our section coming up that, uh, that, that, you know, we'll have for sale at the parade and, and we'll have for sale online at shop.lawrence.com. You can pick up any of our front pages there from this run. Uh, we still got a bunch left. We, we did an extra print run just to make sure we had plenty for people. Uh, I anticipate people are going to want, want to buy these for years to come mm-hmm. or at least months or days. So, um, we, we ramped up the order and, and, uh, we have plenty. So shop.lawrence.com is where you can pick up all of that stuff. You can do some cool stuff with it. You can get a, you can order right there, a commemorative plaque of the front page. So it's not just the paper itself. Um, you can order as many copies of any of that stuff as you want. Our section will be there for sale. Uh, and then we're going to do a, uh, a, a magazine book thing that, uh, kind of recaps the entire run uh the road to number one 
that will will start production on it now but it'll probably be available to to send to people in may-ish june-ish somewhere in there but it's going to be really sharp um the road to number one i believe is the title and and it's not just winning at all right it's also the season that they became the winningest program in college basketball history so there's a little dual meaning there and and it'll have tons of photos and some of our best features throughout the year and then additional content from uh the, the final four from the parade from the welcome home all that stuff so if you're one of those collectible types shop.lawrence.com will be where you want to go for everything that we produce from this run and you can even pre-order some of that stuff right now so check it out and uh the reason i brought it up at all other than to plug the heck out of it is uh is because in that special section i wrote about abaji and and sort of his role um, in this whole thing. And, and again, he was not Danny Manning. Uh, nobody would say he was, but he was that in the most critical moments for this team, because he had to carry the load early when David McCormick was struggling and looked like a guy that you would never consider talking about the rafters. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, he was the guy that carried this team when Remy Martin couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. And Bill Self couldn't even play him. Um, he was the guy that was carrying this team when Jalen Wilson was in his own head, still trying to figure out about his suspension and, and how he let himself down and his team down and his family down and was working through that. Um, all of those things that, that those three dudes became such important parts of why this team won a title. But Ochai's play early and, and for a while um, allowed each of those guys to, to have the room they needed to work through that, to find their footing and, and, and to figure out who they were going to be for this team. And, and so he, in that sense, very much was Danny Manning. I mean, he carried that team uh, in, in terms of the offensive force and just the face and, and, and everybody's top top option to defend and game plan against and all that. And he did it with class and he did it very effectively. I mean, so, you know, Ochai was a, was a beast. Um, and, and he's no doubt this team's MVP, right. From the whole season, the, the yeah. big picture of that. Um, yeah. But, you know, as far as the tournament run, I, I think you could make a case for, for at least those two guys, Remy and Dave to be better than him. And, and, no one cares. Ochai said it too. I don't care. He said, I don't care. You know, we won the national title and that's what they all care about. That's the only thing that mattered to any of them. Um, and, and that is the mark of a true team and a, and a quality team and a, and a, and a group that we heard over and over and over throughout the season, especially, you know, uh, late February, March beyond, um, Bill Self would tell us anytime we talked to him that, that, these guys love each other. They like being around each other. They, they battle for each other. They battle for the program. And, and they did that, man. And, and so as many times as we were told that, I think they went out and proved it mm -hmm. that many times, maybe two times, three times that, just because the way they played was completely team-oriented, completely unselfish basketball. They did not care who scored, when they scored, how they scored. They just wanted to have one more point than the other team at the end. Mm -hmm. And incredibly, um, after a, after a rough sort of stretch to end the regular season where they had to labor to beat TCU and then go to overtime at home to beat Texas in what was just absolute uphill quicksand climbing mm -hmm. to get through those games. Once they did and once they – they got to celebrate on the Allen Fieldhouse floor and they got to feel good about raising the big 12 trophy. And they knew they were, they were guaranteed that if nothing else, they were going to be a team that got this program back to the big 12 title. And that meant something to them. And it means something to everyone around here. So I think that freed their minds and, and really opened them up for this run. Because if you go look at what they did a few days later in Kansas city, that was as loose and as free as I've seen this team or any team hear play in a while at least since 2020 and um they knew they were good but then they just had the the, the they, they eliminated the burden they they took that off their shoulders that heaviness of you have to win or else right and that was gone and at this yeah. point it was just like let's go have fun let's play for each other and let's see what we can do and what they could do was finish the season on an 11 game winning streak yeah. um and, and while some of those games were close some of them weren't and, and this team really 
found a, a gear or a switch where they could put the hammer down and, and beat teams pretty bad. They did it against Villanova. They did it against Miami in the second half. Um, and, and really they did it against Carolina in the second half, even though that ends up being a three point game, um, 47 to 29 in the second half to beat yeah. down. That is a yeah. beat down. Um, yeah. and, and I didn't think they could play better than they did against Miami in the second half of that elite eight game. And I don't think they did. I mean, I, I think there were still some moments in that second half against Carolina where, you know, you, you, you saw them give up second chance, third chance oh, opportunities, yeah. things like oh, yeah. that, that, that allowed Carolina to, to hang around, hang around really uh, the 15 point lead allowed that, but, <laughs> but, you know, okay. You did their share, but, um, but either way, that's two really good second halves to finish the season. And, um, you know, just an incredible run, man. I mean, I was there in 2012. I was there in 2018. I was, I was around in 2008 and, uh, you know, those are, those are widely regarded as the best runs recently, uh, certainly under Bill Self. Um, but man, this one has things that none of those had. And, mm -hmm. and this one will be remembered obviously for the title, but, but obviously for other reasons too, and, and differently. And, um, I think when these players love each other as much and you get to feel that as fans, I think the fans will always remember that, that, that attachment to them as well. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, part of it's NIL too, right? Like for the first time ever, KU fans got to wear Ochai's name and face yeah. on their shirts and, yep. and the two with brown on the back. And, and you know, like as much as that stuff's just trivial, um, I think there's a subconscious thing at play there that, that connects the fan base with the players more than than most because yep. like look i'm repping my guy and 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 that's cool i mean it's very cool that these kids are finally making some money off of things like that and that's a whole other topic that we can probably get into this summer <laughs> but but i think that that as far as the attachment and the fan connection and all that stuff i i think that plays a role in this too um it helps that they won the title because as we've seen around here uh, I've been in Lawrence since 1988, and as we've seen around here, if you can land on that podium at the last Monday night of the season, you're you're a legend. You're remembered mm -hmm. forever. You're beloved. Um, every name of every player on this roster will be remembered forever, and yep. uh, you know they'll always be a national champion, and and that's uh, that's pretty cool. And and uh, you know some of them may stick around forever. Some of them may be in Lawrence forever. Some of them may not even stick with this team i mean we just don't know what the future holds but um no one can take that part away from them you know if someone if someone uh is a national champion they're a national champion for life and that's especially meaningful here in lawrence yep yep there's one point matt you made i want to drift back to real quick with with abaji you um, think that was long-winded or something I, no 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 i, I think you're, <laughs> it, you're, was. You're perfectly, it was it was <laughs> you're perfectly encapsulating all the emotions and everything that goes into it but you know when you talk about what abaji did you know my perspective because we mentioned this really early on was from a little bit of an outsider for the first i don't know 15 games or so and i remember thinking at the time because there was the oklahoma game when he got hurt when he jammed his wrist on the scoreboard right when he missed right. most of the game and then there was the Iowa State game in Iowa when he uh, when he contracted COVID nineteen. Right. And those were two games when I thought to myself, this guy, if he does not score, they're not going to win this game, right? Because that's what was that's what it was early on. He was the one who put the points on the scoreboard, and anything else around that was just secondary peripheral scoring. But I remember thinking about I was thinking about this the other day. That Iowa State game, when when he knew that he wasn't going to play a day or two beforehand, but we didn't know until we were heading up there. You look back at that game. You had uh, Dewan Harris had 14 points. David McCormick had 14 points and 14 rebounds. Uh, Christian Brown had 13 points. Jalen Wilson had 13 points. Remember afterward how they all said, like, this is the time we had to step up for him? And I, I'd like to know, you know, we're not going to get the chance to dig back into a lot of this with them, but – I'd like to know how much that game gave them the confidence that they're just not him because that was not by any means a close game with the way that they played. Right. And for me, looking at that team until then, it was all Abaji. And I think that was really kind of the turning point where, where everybody else was able to assert themselves in their own ways, uh, establish their, their, their roles and their understanding of how the game is played. And, I don't mean it like that, obviously, but just how the team was going to play these games yeah, yeah, and move on without him. And I think that really kind of shifted the turn, uh, shifted the tides for these guys, because 
at that point they knew that it wasn't just him. And I, I sure would like to know how much they gained from that because I didn't think about that until coming home the other day about how he had carried that team for so long after we had talked about that. And then he didn't need to anymore. And it was a team game. Um, and I think that's really unique because you don't get a lot of times when a team can do that. And, and even as Bill Sell said, uh, of what, four or five times after the game, when he was asked the questions about, you know, how the team's going to remember, he just kept saying, you know, for lack of anything better, it would be the 2022 miracle, right? Because he did not want anyone's name right. to be associated with right. this season. I think that proves that, right? Everybody else had their role and they played their role perfectly. Yeah, that's well said. Joe Yusefu played a huge role in that yeah. game. And that yeah, was the first time that those late threes. Yeah. he proved that he can play. And then yeah. from there on, he had some confidence. And, and as much as he didn't play a whole lot in the tournament, he would have been ready at any moment. Yeah. And uh, I agree, man. I mean, first of all, a lot of people lost a lot of money that night because I think as soon <laughs> as people heard Ochai was out, I think people bet the hell out of Iowa State that night, and uh, understandably so. Uh, you know, so um, I, I, I definitely driving up there. That was your first road trip, if you don't count K State. Um, yep. You know that was that was a situation where I, I, I remember the whole drive up there thinking, "What are they going to do? How are they going to win this right. game?" Jalen Coleman Lance started that game, yep. you know, and and yep. that was another guy like he didn't play a whole lot down the stretch in the tournament either. But he kind of settled into that eighth man role. And, and yep. I think it was very telling at the press conference after the after the title, after the confetti, after the net cutting, all that stuff. I mean, there's room for about four, maybe five guys and a coach up at that podium. And there were seven dudes up there when we yeah. walked in. There were seven nameplates, seven extra chairs, and then one for self and one for the moderator. Um and look, man, I mean, self said it all along. There's we have seven starters. That's how he views it. I've always kind of rolled my eyes when he's said that in the past. I get what he means, but like you don't, you know, like you're, you're well, and then when you start the same five such, all right? year. Yeah. <laughs> like that's yeah. If you have seven guys, you're rotating them. He wasn't ever rotating them, right? Right. right. Said, two key reserves that were coming in at the under 16. But that was it. It was like that was that was this team. They were yep. seven strong. Um, I, I had a, a, whether it was Twitter or a message board comment or something, I don't really remember, but somebody suggested might've even been an email. Somebody suggested we refer to this team as the magnificent seven. And I think that's already sure. taken, but, um, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, like times. that, that's what they were. And, and, and that's not to say that Yusefu and J Cole and, and KJ Adams and even Zach Clements, that, that those guys didn't play a role because they did, they should wear their rings mm -hmm. with pride. I mean, Clements came in for one game and helped shut down Tanner Groves. Huge yep. moment. You know, yep. I mean, like when you look back at, at the razor's edge that this season was played on up to the postseason, if they lose that game without Ochai and Iowa State, that affects their seeding. If, if, if Clemens can't come in and shut down Groves there and they lose at home to OU, that affects their psyche and their season. Um, you know, Joe Yusefu big in that game, as we talked about, uh, there's just every one of those guys had a role. And and even though they didn't play big minutes, they, they should feel like this is their team, too. And they should feel really, uh, really proud of what they helped them, them accomplish. Because yeah. the other thing about that is while that was their role on game night, no one knows what their role was in practice. I mean, we don't get to see that very often. And, and yeah. so to know that you've got a guy like Joe Yosefu, who was a beast in the tournament last year, um, coming in and pushing your guys in, in a, in a, you know, in a practice setting, J Cole, um, free money is what, what he became known as because in, yeah. in practices he would knock down open shots and yell free money. I mean, um, that's a, that's a dead eye shooter that, that will challenge this national championship lineup and, and make it hard on him in practice. Clements with his length, Adams with the way he works his tail off. I mean, those dudes contributed beyond their stats. You know, they contributed in practice. And I know that sounds like a like a very youth soccer, orange slices and snacks after the game <laughs> thing. But but man, these are still kids and this is still amateur sports. And and I know it may not be for a lot of people and in a lot of ways, but but you know, that stuff matters. This isn't, this isn't their job. This isn't the NBA where they have, uh, you know, this is a career situation. They're, they're still trying to get there. And so yep. um, those dudes should all feel like this was theirs too. And, yep. and I'm sure they do partly because they know they contributed, but the other part is because that, that seven, that seven on the podium, 
I guarantee those guys made him feel like they were a big part of it. And yep. uh, to me, that's, that's, uh, that's really cool to think about because it did come down when, when the tournament got tight, it came down to those seven. And um, what I think is also really cool. Somebody talked about redemption, the word redemption with me. And so that's kind of what the theme of this team is um, and has been. And, and, and in some ways, sure. You know, I mean, Jalen Wilson, redeemed himself right after the bad mistake early in the season. And then he, he paid for it, owned up to it and came back and was a huge part of this season, the way everybody expected him to be. Um, that's redemption. David McCormick written off a million times, criticized a million times so much so that outside of the locker room in new Orleans, after the championship, Bill self's talking about him and he's calling him the much maligned David yep. McCormick. I mean, like for a coach to reference that, Coaches don't care about that stuff. They don't care about what other people say or think, really. Um, for him to reference that shows you how maligned David McCormick was. And any of you listening know that. Um, many of you listening probably contributed to that. I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dave was a train wreck at times, not only this year, but in his career. Um, but, man, he was there when it counted, and and he's got the net now, like you said. And, yep. and that's redemption. Um I just think that that there's a lot of that in play here. And, and I think that, um, you know, this was a team that, that I, I, you know, good team, talented roster, a, a group of guys that people, people know can play, but I don't know that anybody saw him winning the title and, and, and redemption too. I mean, Christian Brown clearly held on to that idea after losing to USC last year that when, when self was like, we got to get more athletic and we got to get bigger. We got to get faster. I mean, and then guess what? You go start four of the same five guys the rest yeah. of the way the next year. So they didn't go at, I mean, they did add Yosefu and Remy Martin and, and J Cole and some other pieces like that, but their core was the same team. Those guys just got better. And that yeah. in itself is redemption. So um, the redemption theme's really legitimate. I think it fits. I think it's overblown a little. I think it's dramatic because I think they're better than that. I don't think that's what drove them uh at, at the at the peak i think their peak fuel if you will their, their their peak motivating factor was the fact that they cared about each other and they and they fought for each other and they wanted to do this as a team and play hard for each other and and i think that trumps redemption but i think the redemption kind of built that up so yeah um just i mean it just is it's a remarkable run and and you look at all these bill self teams or the roy williams teams that were something in two or something in three and had no, no, uh, nobody that could touch them. And then they flame out one night on a bad night in the tournament and it, it all goes for not, you know, I mean, there've been plenty of teams like that, that both of those coaches mm -hmm. had. And, and that's the beauty of the tournament and also the, the, the agony of the tournament. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. the best team, sometimes the most talent doesn't win, but in order for that to be the case, then you get a team like this, that, that is, super talented but also puts it together the best and makes a run that you know nobody look no one surprised kansas the program the name that the 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 blue blood nobody surprised kansas won the, the 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 tournament this year the ncaa title but i think people when they look are a little bit surprised that this kansas team did and I understand that, but if you if you're around it like we were and and you saw it not only this year but but for my in my case building over the last three years um you knew what this meant to these guys yeah. and and you knew they were going to lay it on the line and and doesn't mean they're going to win doesn't mean they're not going to win but it means they're going to be there and they're going to try and, and they're going to give it their best shot and 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 they did man it would have been really easy to fold and be tight against miami they didn't it would have been really easy to quit against carolina i mean carolina looked great in that first half they didn't they believed in themselves and they said, we're just going to keep coming while we have a breath left and see where it falls at the end. And, and so, mm -hmm. you know, my hat's off to them, man. I mean, they they put in the work. They 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 stayed where they needed to stay in their minds. And um, for, for more than just three, four weeks here, I mean, for careers, for years. And uh, I, I think for that reason, these guys deserve everything they're going to get from this. And that's that they're going to be remembered forever. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think Matt, to your point, you know, you don't see anymore. You're not going to see, I can't believe you're going to see teams go 33 and three or 
like Kentucky in, in 2015, right? 38 no, and then losing, you know, right. in the title game. I don't think that's the way that college basketball is going to be anymore because I think you see with, I know the extra year of eligibility for the pandemic is going to expire soon because we're somehow so far away from that, but the immediate transfers, right? You've got players who realize if they don't have a good situation, they can go somewhere else and make an impact. Or if they think they've been overlooked, they can go make an impact. I think the way that roster dynamics are now taking shape in college sports, you're going to have so much more parity where you're going to have your national champions now going forward, losing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 games a year, and then just be the one standing at the end. And so, yes, this team did not have that kind of dynamic personality that you would expect. You would have clearly seen, obviously, in 88. But even with with anybody else in the past, there's not that one magnetic, that center of gravity that everybody is just like, that's the guy and those are the players around him. I don't think you're going to see that much more in college hoops just because of the way that the game is heading. It's going to be who's going to figure it out over the course of the season and who's going to have the best four, five, six above average players to go through to win the title. And I think maybe there's a very good chance that this is the start of that. Maybe even last year with Baylor, right? Maybe even Baylor was, was, was kind of the same thing. They had great players, but there was no massive dynamic, you know, number one pick talent on that, on that team. So um, you're not going to get those two, three lost teams anymore, because I think this is the way college basketball is heading. And I think Bill Self was wise to fill out his team with those athletic guys that he needed who had experience, Remy Martin, obviously, is probably one of the very top cream of the crop type of players you're going to get in the transfer portal. But this is how college sports, college basketball, I think, is going to be these days. And it's going to be, can you gut it out and win it when games matter the most? And that's what these guys just did. Yeah, I hope it is. I hope you're right, because I hope I hope there's incentive to stick around now, too. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, the one and done thing is by no means over. They're going, I mean, Kendall Brown at Baylor. Yep. He he declared, right? And he, yep. he had a yeah, good season at Baylor. He wasn't a superstar. He wasn't right. all Big 12. He didn't lead them to a title, but his frame, his measurables, his skill set says he's got a jump now. So he's going yep. to. So yep. that's going to still be a part of this. I mean, th- those guys aren't going away. And, and the- Yeah, I mean, look at your your NBA draft is going to be Paula Benchero, is going to be Chet right. Holmgren, is going to be Jabari Smith. Like, you that's, you know, that's these guys, right? Shaden Sharp didn't even play for Kentucky, and he's yeah. going to probably be a top five pick, right? Yeah. So that one and done isn't gone. But I do think maybe there is now – this is idealistic of me, I guess, but there's some understanding that if you're not going to do that, maybe stay in school over a year or two and elevate your game with somebody who can teach you to play rather than just kind of yo-yoing around on a roster in the NBA and flying to Greensboro on a Wednesday night and dealing with that, because that doesn't seem to be really the NBA dream either too. No, so no. I know it's not my decision to make, right. I've never been presented with these things, but um, I think for the goodness of the sport and the entertainment value of the games, when you have, those name, those name value players, those experienced players sticking around, um, it's going to draw more people in and make them have that connection. Because I think what's been abundantly clear is people are very much connected to these players because they've known them for three years. They know who they are. That's been the case at Kansas for a long time. Yep. Um, you know, as much as, as Joel Embiid and Andrew Wiggins were fun to have around for the fans, they didn't know them. They yep. knew Thomas Robinson. They helped Thomas Robinson through a tragic time in his life where his mother died. I mean, yep. they, they they collectively grabbed him and hugged him as a fan base and helped him through that. I mean, um, even Silvio, whose, whose career was, you know, um, nothing like he envisioned it going, um, at least not after that first semester that he was here and helped play in a Final Four. Um, th- these people got to know him and 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 – you know, rode that, that journey with him and, and same with Devonte Graham and Frank Mason and now Ochai and, and others, you know? So um, yeah, that's always been a huge part of it here anyway, and, and probably elsewhere. Um, and I think what's cool about your whole, your whole hypothesis there is, is that like, there's incentive to stay in school now. I mean, you can make yes, some money. You can make money. You, know? and, you can have and, a car deal. You can have your name on billboards. Totally you can have- right. David McCormick standing outside that Wendy's on 23rd street, spreading his wings as long as possible. Right. You know, there's right. reasons to get, you can, what did we see uh, with the raising canes, right? Giving out the, the chicken sandwiches. And there were a hundred million people in that parking lot, right? Like there Pretty is cool. reason for guys to stick around because they can make some coin. Yeah. And that, that, that's great because you don't want this to become a black and white thing where, well, I mean, I've seen it, man. And, and, you know, I know other fans, the fans here have seen it. Like, 
I'm not saying I'm special, but, but I've seen guys leave Kansas early that probably would have come back if they could have, yep. and you know, um, the, the, the system said, no, you got to go now it's maximize yep. your earning potential. And, and, um, it worked out for some of them. It didn't for others. It, it did for Kansas. It didn't for Kansas. I mean, you know, all those things are in play there. So it's, uh, it's cool that that's not as heavy anymore. And, and that a guy like Ochai can make that decision. And, and what's cool about Ochai is he came back and he could have killed it with NIL this year. Um, he could have, I mean, he's a good looking kid. He's got that charismatic smile. He's friendly to everybody. Yeah. He's got the unique name. He's a known commodity. He could have killed it with NIL. And I think he did fine, but he said from the very beginning, I'm not interested in that. I'm here to win. I want to yeah. work on my game. And, 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 and that's why I'm back and good for him. It worked. He's a national freaking champion, man. Yeah. And, 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 and so that's it, right? Like you just mentioned, Ochai could have gone last year. He would have been drafted somewhere and he'd have been flying to Greensboro. He came back, he put in his time, he put in the work and uh, you know, he, he left a national champion and a freaking legend. Like mm -hmm. he was always going to be remembered as a nice player, um, a big part of a bunch of good teams, but good God, he's a legend now. Yep. I mean, Bill Self is throwing him around as well, the best season since Danny Manning. Holy cow. Like, yep. and he's not wrong. I mean, yep. in some ways, in some ways you could say it was a better season than Danny Manning's. Now yep. Danny was player of the year um, and also the number one pick, which I can't touch those, but Ochai was a player of the year finalist. Ochai will not be a number one pick, but top 20 probably. Um, yeah. But Ochai did things that Danny didn't do. He won the, the regular season Big 12 title, um, the tournament title. Danny didn't do either of those in the big eight days. And, and that's not because he didn't you know, succeed. It's because there were teams that were better than Kansas, but yep. not when it counted, right? And so uh, what I'm most interested in seeing with this whole situation and, and everything that kind of comes out of this is, is Ochai is a pretty sweet blueprint. And something that, that the coaching staff, especially, and not just at Kansas, but around the country, can point to and say, yeah, you can leave. Go ahead. I mean, you, you'll probably get picked. Or you can do what he did. Yep. And how much that will mean to guys, how much that will resonate, how much they'll believe it, how much they'll want to do it remains to be seen. Because Ochai, I think one of the things that that probably will get overlooked a little bit and, and absolutely shouldn't is – if you look back at the, the Bill Self era um, of Kansas basketball, that's obviously still ongoing. I, I don't know that you could find one guy that worked as hard as Ochai did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Put himself I, mean, I don't know that, but that, that right. seems like the case, right? They've mentioned that all year long. He's on, he's on, one, he's on a, a one-hand count type of thing. You know, maybe yeah. Frank Mason. Um, his senior year was remarkable player of the year thing. He put in a ton of work. Um, but But – he was obviously gaining on it anyway. He was pretty damn good as a junior and, and, uh, and Ochai was too, but, but he, the, the level, the, the, the stratosphere that he entered into by putting in that work and, and becoming that dude, um, it, it shows you how much, how much went into that. And so it's not automatic for like, let's take Christian Brown, um, possible first round pick had a good year has some holes in his game could come back could leave if he leaves i don't think anyone will blame him but if he comes back and he does what ochai did is he a national player of the year candidate is he a big 12 player of the year is he is he is he in that realm and and i think the answer remains to be seen i think the answer right now is could be right mm -hmm. like that that's what ochai has shown us that that yep. he could be um but it's not automatic it yeah. would take the same amount of work, which Christian Brown knows that and, and knows and has seen and it. Saw it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's important. But, but, you know, I, I think the, the cautionary tale part of this is like, don't just tell kids that you can come back and do this without telling them what that takes, because right. it takes an ass load of work. I mean, it right. takes like putting everything else aside. It takes pushing yourself to the path, to the point of where you're not comfortable, where you're, you're in pain. You, you know, Ochai deserves everything he got. And, and the, the MOP pick may have been lazy. Like we talked about, I think we both agreed, but man, the, the MVP of, of Kansas's title team is undeniably Ochai. Yep. And, and he doesn't care about either one of them, you know, yep. he, he doesn't. So, yep. um, 
So I, I want to go back to Remy. We'll, we'll wrap it up here pretty quickly, but I want to go back to Remy because he was a chapter unto himself this whole season. And so if we don't yeah. give him his own time on this one, it would be us failing. And, and uh, I don't like doing that. So real quick, man, your, your perception of the Remy oh, Martin yeah. thing, because the difference for you and for me is, um, I, you know, I was there when he committed, I talked to him. Uh, I got a feel for how excited he was about self and about Kansas. Um, I know he wanted to go pro, but, but I also know that he felt like, Hey, he was a pretty darn good, you know, fallback plan. If that didn't work out. Um, I was there when he played his first game in Allen Fieldhouse, and fans are chanting his name. And it's like a freaking rock star came to town. I mean, like the Beatles were here, like the buzz surrounding Remy Martin was insanity and it was cool to see. And then it disappeared. And so, you know, I had the wave of the whole thing and, and you did in, in some ways too, but, but, you know, um, you didn't have that starting point of where like, right. this is really good. Like, right. This looks fun. The people are all about it. And he's full of electricity. I mean, by the time you came around, he was, he was dark Remy, you know, he, he was not in a good place, whether he was healthy or not, he, whether he was playing or not, he, he was not what he finished. And, and so I wonder from your perspective, how, how, how'd all that look? And um, did you buy that Remy would do this? Cause I always did. I all, I always did. I believed that he would still be a factor. Didn't know he'd be in the MOP discussion. Didn't know he'd win them tournament games. You know, I, I didn't know that, but, but I always believe that there was still time and, and a place for him to come out and be effective if he could be healthy. And, and obviously that's what happened. Let me just do that real quick, <laughs> pat myself on the back, but no, that's not what it's about. I'm just saying like, because of his immense talent and because Kansas needed it, I always thought, you know, in, until there's no games left, I'm going to still believe that this dude can be a factor. And it was right. close. It was really close. But from your perspective, what, what was that, that journey like to watch that to cover that and 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 now to sit here thinking he was you know maybe 10 points against Villanova away from being the MOP himself and having his name in the rafters and that would have been the most unbelievable thing of all time yep yep so I think the strange thing for me is uh, he I believe he injured the knee against Nevada right yep so that's before me and then he plays I think he sits the next game against George Mason and then plays against Oklahoma state and was nothing spectacular. And then fell out of the starting lineup as they tried to manage his minutes and manage his soreness. And then he went down for a month. Right. So yep, yep. those first three or four games when he was originally managing his soreness, when he was a shell of himself because he was excruciatingly in pain, that's what I saw. Right. So right. I see Remy Martin as this guy who comes in, who is just a, he's a backup point guard, right? He's a backup point guard. Who's not making great decisions. Who's not playing great defense. Who's not really doing a whole lot other than being what to me looks like kind of a, and uh, a glorified freshman, right? Like somebody who just doesn't know the system doesn't know what's going on. So I know I knew of him, obviously having lived in the city and watched games for three years, I knew what he was about, but what I didn't really understand was, the degree to where that hype was because he just wasn't himself. And so he disappears for seven games. Um, and that's when I'm starting to really kind of figure out what's going on. And then he comes back and he comes back against Baylor at Baylor. And that was a, a bad game for them for a lot of reasons. And it wasn't anything spectacular. And I think he had like a, I don't know, maybe two or three shots in that game. And, and they lost, um, they had won yeah, seven right. in a row and then they lost when he's back yeah. and you're going, Holy cow. I mean, it wasn't his fault they lost, but like, no, you're thinking, did this upset the whole chemistry of this thing? Right. And then he comes back and then he still is not really scoring, not really shooting, not really doing anything offensively for two or three games. And then, um, you know, you kind of always, you know, that mystique and that aura was there where then he earns the start against Texas on senior day and he still doesn't do, I don't think really anything in that game. That was the game when Harris played really well in the second half and, and Bill Self said he couldn't even bother thinking about putting Martin back in because he just was going so well otherwise. But then the, the postseason happens, right? And then the postseason happens, and it just, like, it's like they had just made some massive trade deadline acquisition and brought some guy in who just spurred them to success, right? And it was it was so stark for me to see, like, 
I couldn't comprehend that this was the same guy who had been limping through the previous eight weeks since he, he, he bruised his knee, right? Um, he was fun to watch. He's energetic. He's exciting. He's weird, right? Like, I think I'll always remember that one clip that we saw over and over again um, when he went to go, when he knocked down that, that and one and went to go run over and hug Bill Self. And Bill Self just like shrugged him off because it was such an uncomfortable moment because that was Remy being happy and Bill was just being Bill and didn't know how to handle him. But um, to see that guy come in and play the way that he did, I think was... It, it was remarkable given what I could reconcile from the first half of the season. And I cannot imagine what they would have been like if they had had him all year long. It wouldn't have mattered. Right? They won the national championship anyway. So right. what's it matter? But um, he was just, I mean, an exciting breath of fresh air for, for that offense, especially because everybody seemed to love him. Um, we, we talked to Bill afterward and he made the joke about like how Remy kept saying, we'll wait till March. And he's like, what do you mean wait till March? I can't see anything of you now. And I'm going to count on you in March. Yeah. And then well, look what happened. So and that, that's it, man. That's the most important part of the whole story because, yeah. because the bill self, I know that I've covered for 15 years or whatever it's been now. Um, he doesn't play that game. He yeah. does not this. He does not let players decide you know, how things go. I mean, he, he gives them a leash and he gives them uh, the ability to be leaders and take ownership and all that. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a total dictatorship by any means, right. but, but he does not let guys say, just trust me, coach. You know, I mean, they it's, have to yeah. trust him. It's the opposite. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and yet here he was hands tied. Well, if I'm ever going to get anything out of this guy, like I thought I was getting when we got him, I have to trust him. Yep. And they were almost ran out of time, but those last couple of games where he was able to at least get back on the floor and shake some of the rust off and just feel the game again, allowed him to, to take a little bit more confidence into the big 12 tournament. And then he had some success there. And that, that life came back, that flair, that yep. Remy Martin character and experience. Um, the full Remy, you know, that, that was back and you could see yep. the life in his eyes again. And, and that was enough time. Those, those few games at the end and then the big 12 tournament, that was enough time by this much. I mean, just barely yep. uh, for, for self to see, okay, I, 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 he's back and I, and I see what he can give us and I'm going to, I'm going to try to figure out how to make that work. And then yep. they did, and it solidified the rotation even more. And it made things, I mean, they didn't, they went through the tournament not having to think, right? Like Remy and Mitch are going in at the first TV timeout. Yep. Everyone knew that. The opponent knew that. We knew that. Those guys knew that. That was the way it was going to go. And, yep. and then they were going to see what Remy gave them. And if he gave them a lot, he'd stay out there. And if he didn't, he'd take a break. And then he tried again in the second half. And if he gave him some more, I mean, Remy closed a lot of games. Remy he closed did. a lot of games. And, and at no point did that ever mean that Dewan Harris was no good because Bill Self went out of his way to remind people how good and important Dewan Harris was on this team. Yeah. And so their dynamic, and I wrote about this at the final four uh, briefly, but, but they talked about it a little bit and, and their dynamic as a, as a, as a duo, right? Like, it wasn't like it was, you know, um, A and B. It wasn't like it was black and white. It wasn't like two opposite things. It was like they were one point guard, and they they had to figure out together how to how to, how to be that. And mm -hmm. and they offered different things at different times, and they play different minutes. Some they played together. Well, they but, play together. Yeah, you know how often do they play together? Probably four or five minutes a game, right, too. Right. So everything about it everything about it doesn't work unless those two make it work. So I'll, I'll roll out the freaking red carpet to give bell self credit for how he handled it because he got so far out of his comfort zone in how to handle a player like that, that I can only think that's going to help in the future. Now it's going to take a special player for that. Again, he's yeah. not going to just do that for um, you know, for, for Kyle cuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to take a guy that he thinks can help him win a national championship and can be an, a difference maker. And that's what Remy was. Yep. So, so, you know, he was pushed to a certain comfort zone um, by a player that was deserving of that. So don't expect to see it automatically again, but it could happen. And now he knows it's possible. And now he, 
maybe has a little more comfort in that 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 area um, or operating that way. But I think the most important part, as much as self deserves credit, I give those two guys, Harris and Martin, the most credit because if there was so much as a hint of ego or or jealousy or you know whatever between the two of them it wouldn't have worked no Uh, for sure but Juan loved Remy and he loved what he brought to this team and he loved that he helped him I mean that took some of the burden off of off of Dewan's shoulders you know and and Remy loved Dewan because how do you not like Dewan he's such a good kid man and and he's team 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 all the way and he wasn't trying to trying to take anybody's luster or take anybody's shine or anything like that. He's just trying to win games. And he does it in a manner that says, I want you to score first. I want you to score second. I want you to score third. And then I want you to score fourth, fifth, and sixth. And then if I have to score, I'll score. Yep. So perfect teammate, terrific player, talented dude, you know, so, so the two of them being able to, to coexist as, as these selfless players who, who literally just wanted to win. I mean, Remy wanted the shine and the, and the, and the, and the flair, but, but not because he needed it. That's just him. I mean, to take that away from him is to, to take the player away. I mean, that's, it's not like an act it's, it's him. And, yep. and so I think that Dewan was, was, it was easier for Dewan to be selfless like that because that's who he is. And, but, but Remy was also selfless in that he, didn't care about anything but winning, but he was going to have a damn good time while he did that. And, and those two things that kind of melded together there, I, I think made Kansas a lot to handle. And, and it really solidified that, that point guard position. It solidified sort of the, the, you know, the on the court leadership roles. And, uh, and, and it, again, it made it made life easier for Ochai. It made life easier for Wilson and Brown. Um, in some ways, even in McCormick and, and Lightfoot, you know, so um, I, I think that the, the, the craziest thing ever is how this Remy Martin experience went so far up and so far down and so far up and so far down for a while. And then for it to finish the way everybody expected it would, like when he came, he was, that's the best transfer in the country. Kansas just got him. He could be a national championship piece. And then for six months, it didn't look like that at all. And then at the end, it looked exactly like everybody expected it would. Um, he's out there making plays, and they're winning a title. I mean, just re- a remarkable story, and uh, and and so many people deserve credit for it. Not just him, not just self, but but so many people. And um, it it's uh, it, it's still kind of it's it's still kind of hard to to grasp that that really happened. To be yeah. honest, I mean, because like you said, when you first came around. Remy was in a dark place and injured and legitimately just a non-factor. Yep. And then he was a hair from being the most outstanding player of the final four. Incredible. Yep. Incredible. Yep. And those shots he hit in the second half. I mean, I looked this up last night cause I wrote a little something. Um, every, every three pointer he made in the second half and he hit four and the, and the one in the first half he banked in and he just was disgusted by it. And he wanted to <laughs> yeah. jump off the, off the floor and just hide because he was so mad at himself for such an ugly shot, but it went in and, and they went by three. So you'll take it. Um, yeah. But, but the three shots he hit in the second half, the three, three pointers, each one of them broke a tie. And for that, I mean, that, that just shows you what a gamer he is, man. Yeah. I mean, a couple of them were in the last three minutes. The one that puts it, breaks a 65 all tie a step back after a ball screen by Dave with Bacot extending his arm fully at you. And then just a dead swish. I mean, the dude was a gamer and a big time player and, and man, I mean, everything he delivered throughout the tournament, they needed everything. And, um, you know, yeah, there's no question in my mind and in many, many others minds too, that Kansas doesn't even come close to winning a title without Remy Martin. And that's why they went out and got him. So uh, for all those, for all those days where it looked like a Ken Joe was, Oh, that, that he'd be a nice player. Or, you know, this, that, this guy, this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy, whatever. Remy's just not, not been it. Boy, he was it when it counted. And, and, uh, and, and yeah, that, that quick conversation with self outside of the locker room after they won it, where he said that, that line that you just mentioned about, he just kept telling me, just wait till March. My God, he's a prophet. I mean, yeah. he's a prophet. He knew. 
And, and that's because he knew he was hurt and that's because he knew his confidence in his game and himself and what he could do. He, he knew he could do it if just given the opportunity mm-hmm. and, and amazingly against all odds, somehow it played out that way. He got the opportunity. He took advantage of it and he's cutting down nets and he looks happier than probably he's ever been in his life. I mean, yep. just a remarkable story. So yep. Yep. Um, I, I, I think it's uh I think it's just one of the things people will remember about this team because I don't think it overshadows any of them. Um, But, but it's a big one and it was a big one in real time as they were trying to win this thing. So um, Zach, we've gone over an hour. We call this the KU sports hour. A lot of times we'll dip in for about 30, 40 minutes. And I, you know, I still like the title though. Um, But this is the first one we've done over an hour in a long time. So I hope people are enjoying it. Is there anything you want to end on any final thoughts? Um, we don't have to have this be the last one, although you are going to take vacation next week, well-earned. And so we won't have one next week, but shortly thereafter that we can jump back in. Probably a lot will happen while you're gone. That's just the way it goes when you yeah. leave, right? Things will happen. So yeah, for sure. Right. <laughs> so we'll yeah, have no. time to jump back in, you know, a couple of weeks removed from all this craziness and chaos, but, but, Pick a topic, pick a note. It can be short and sweet, whatever. Pick pick something to end us on and send us out, and uh, we'll call it good there. What do, yeah, what do you got? Yeah, just thinking, just looking future forward, man. I just think that really these next couple of weeks, you know, you've got, I guess, now till a May 1st deadline to, to make your transfer decisions known to be eligible, right? These next few weeks are going to be really, really chaotic, I think, for, for this program. And so All I'm programs. curious to see what happens, right? you know? Um, you've got NBA decisions that need to be made. You've got uh, transfer decisions that need to be made. You've got, you know, perceived holes on the roster that need to be filled. So I'm actually, I'm actually interested to see where they go from here because um, I think you're going to see a vastly different team next season. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, it's probably not a good thing considering the fact that they just won the national championship, <laughs> but you know, you could have a very a different looking team next year. And I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see how that shapes up. So maybe the next time we have a chance to do this and talk, we'll have some things to dissect, but those decisions need to be made soon and they're accelerating. And, you know, I, I just think that the dynamic is going to be so different from what we see this year come September, October, November, and then into the season. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. There's no way it will be different, even if the decisions that are made are most guys come back and they run it back with three or four starters. It'll still be a different team because you're not yeah. going to have Ochai. You're not going to have Remy uh, yeah. at the very least and, yeah. and probably more than that. So yeah. uh, I, at least I think so. I mean, you're not you're not willing to kind of go out on a bang here and predict that Ochai will be back. Are you? Is that something you want to <laughs> no, put your no, name on? No, but I think I do think, <laughs> man, I I do think there's a, a Dave thing there that I don't think he comes back either, but he can. He has the year of eligibility and he's been really weird about making a decision. Right. So I don't think, I think there's like a 2% chance he would return, but I just think that his decision is way more complicated than anybody else's. Yeah. So I just, I, I, I'd like to know what's going through his mind and where he ends up, whether that's trying to pursue a professional career or playing somewhere else. Cause I think his decision is probably the most difficult of anybody's. He can't come back. I mean, you can't end it better than that. And, no, and um, you know, he, he came in with Ochai. He's going to leave with Ochai, yep. um, in my opinion. And, and I think everybody's going to be good with that. I don't yep. think there's going to be any situation where they're going to, they're going to try to talk him into coming back. No. They don't, they don't do that. First of all, they don't, they don't do that. They didn't try to talk Wiggins into coming back. They didn't try to talk Embiid into coming back. They didn't try to talk, Tristan and Aruna into coming back. They don't, they don't try to talk anybody into coming back. They want these guys to make the best decision for themselves. They yeah. will give them honest feedback. They will tell them the, the, the straight truth. Hey, here's how much you're going to play or, Hey, you're not going to play at all or whatever. And, and that's why these guys make these decisions with such comfort because they are getting the full picture. It's not a, yep. it's not a, it's not a game. It's not, it's not a, you know, well, we're going to tell you this and then it's going to be that, you know, there, there's, there's none of that. So, um, he can't come back in my opinion. And, 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 it, and, it, and if he did, I think he's just hurting his legacy. I mean, I think yeah. this is oh, it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like for sure. people are talking about putting his name in the rafters. I will write something about that. I do not believe it belongs up there, but I understand why people do. And I think that the fact that you can end your career with the net around your neck and people talking about you being in the rafters, the same people who said they never wanted to see you play basketball again, they're going to come back. (laughs) Yeah. Why would you not just say, 
I'm good. Sort of the George yep. Costanza thing. That's it yep. for me. I'm yep. out of here. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and his stock will never be higher either. Like, yep. you know, I don't know that he'll be drafted, um, but he'll get a look. Right. And, yep. and two months ago, well, that's the thing is right. All these other that. guys who are weighing these decisions have very clear cut NBA futures. His right. is not very clear cut. Right. So I feel like for him, it's, you know, my, now my professional career is going to be, hoping to land a G league spot probably, or otherwise making a career 10 years playing in beautiful places overseas. Right, I would right. take that any day, the, you know, whatever, but um, his decision is not clear NBA path. And I think that's what makes it really interesting. That's why I'd love to get inside his mind. Well, we'll figure out a way we'll find out <laughs> um, somehow. We That's what we do. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. I mean, Jalen Wilson and, and Christian Brown are at the very least going to test. Yep. And I believe Jalen can do it again. So yep. uh, I think there was a time when you could only They've do changed it once. That. You, can only, yeah. you can do it as many times as you want. Right. right. So they're going to both test. And, and um, you know, uh, the feedback will be king there. And, and we'll get into this more. I'll write more. We'll, we'll come back and do a, another podcast on this topic by itself. But, but the feedback will be king there. I mean, just like it was with Ochai. He was ready to go. He yep. wanted to leave. Um, and, and um you know, so did Svi the year before or, or or the year before he decided to come back for his senior season. He was ready to go. He took it to the 11th hour. They both came back. They both made good decisions. Svi got to a final four and was drafted and, and ended up, you know, carving out a pretty nice little career, making some money. All right. Yeah. Um, Ochai, obviously, we know what coming back did for him. So, um, you know, the, the, this is this is a situation where where these guys are at a great program they've got good families and they've got good advice around them. So the feedback will be King. I don't, I don't think if, if someone tells Christian Brown, listen, you'll get, you'll get drafted mid twenties right now. Or if you want to go back and work on this, this, and this, you might get drafted in the lottery. And when you do get drafted, you might play instead of just being drafted and being on a team. Maybe that's enough for him to come back. I I think he could still come back. Um, I've talked to some draft people, I, I think there's there's the belief in that circle that um, he would do himself some favors by coming back and, mm-hmm. and sort of seeing if he can make that OJ jump. And, you know, he's seen it. So I think he could still come back. I won't be shocked if he leaves, but I think he could still come back. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Jalen, I think, should probably come back. I think he's yeah. still got plenty to work on. And if whether CB comes back or not, Jalen can make that Ochai type of jump and be the man and show that he's got more to his game than just what he's shown lately. Uh, he, most importantly, he needs to become a better shooter. Um, he's a better shooter than his numbers show. I know that by being around him, but he shot 26% from three point range this year. That ain't it. That, yeah. you know, that's just not, that's not going to make the NBA go, Oh, we got to yeah. have that guy. So in my opinion, he's smart to come back and uh, we'll see if he does. Um, but but again, they're going to go, they're going to test, they're going to get all that information as much as they can possibly want. And, and I think they're all smart enough because they've seen it play out with other guys in front of them. And, and self has been very good helping guys navigate this, this situation yeah. um, that, that they'll make the right decision. And, and um, if that means they come back, they come back. If that means they leave, they leave. But I will end here because we will get into this more, but I will end here. I will go on record saying I absolutely want Christian Brown to come back. Number one, cause I'm not done having him yell at me. Um, <laughs> I feel like everyone sitting courtside like that after every one of those moments that the, the, the violence that he yells to the crowd with it, it, it washes over me uh, and, and sometimes <laughs> takes my soul a little bit. So I like that stuff. And, and I know Kansas fans do too. Um, so I, 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 I will go on record saying I, I hope he's back because I want that more and I want to see him play with Grady Dick. I want to see the two of them oh, play yeah. together because I think that could be a ridiculously dangerous and, and effective duo um, surrounded by, you know, a Jalen Wilson, a, uh, a MJ Rice type, a Joe Yosefu, a Dewan Harris. I mean, and, and whatever else Kansas can bring into the mix. But, uh, but, but the bottom line, you know, they've got four guys coming in in this class and uh, th- it's a good class, talented group. And they're going to lose Remy, who was a pretty important point guard, and probably lose Dave, who was a pretty critical big man, and Mitch, who was and Mitch. 
yep. you know, one and one a right there. Right. Like those two, just like Remy and Dewan did at the, at the point, those two did that at the five and made yep. for one pretty good five all year. So, um, and they do not offer seventh years of eligibility. Yeah, no, he would find it if they did. He would find it. But but he's going to go make some money somewhere too. He will play and he will have fun and and uh, probably overseas. And and what a great life he's got ahead of him. That's awesome. Yep. So, um, but either way, right? Like those are those are two positions they're going to need something. And so that's where you're talking about the transfer stuff and the portal and all that. I mean, this is this is a never ending story. It always happens. I wrote this the other day. You want a national title? Cool. Congratulations. You better get recruiting the next day because yeah. Kentucky, they've been recruiting since March 17th when they lost. Yep. So, you know, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Purdue, Texas, those teams, they've been recruiting for a while now. Michigan State, another one. You got to get out there. And they are. They are and they will and they know that. But, you know, it was a nice little uh, detour along the way. So um, Kansas is your 2022 national champion. Drink it in, soak it in, enjoy every second of it. I know you guys will because I've lived here for a long time and I see what this means to this town and how beloved and, and remembered these, these types of teams are. So um, it's going to be cool to watch that for the next several decades. And uh, if you're looking for mementos and collectibles in our special section that I finally could say in one foul breath, um, it's at shop.lawrence.com. You can check out all of our front pages and different items there for sale commemorating this stuff. So um, enjoy that. And, uh, and thanks for supporting us and, and reading along all, all the way. Um, I've told Zach this. I've told many people this. I've told a lot of you this. Like, I love my job. We love our jobs. We love what we do. But a big part of that is the interaction with fans and readers and things like that. It's, it's, uh, it makes this thing so much fun because – um, it's a grind. There's no doubt about it. We were gone for the better part of a month from our homes and our families. And, and, uh, it it's awesome to cover and it's a lot of fun, but, um, it makes it a lot of fun hearing from you guys and, and getting ideas from you. And, and when you guys tell us, uh, you're dead wrong, you're an idiot. That's fine too. I, I love, I love it all. You guys know that by now. I, I just make sure I, the message is a little bit more, uh, you know, massaged. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's fine too. I'm, I'm good. It wouldn't be the first or last time that I've been called an idiot. Um, sometimes by people even closer to me. So, um, it, it, it the point is your, role in what we do is is so important i mean not only because you visit the site and all that stuff but just the interaction the feedback the engagement it's it's a blast and uh it makes it a lot of fun i think i can speak for zach on that and you guys are just getting to know zach so warm up a little bit more to him and then start calling him an idiot as much as you want to he can take it i promise you hey thanks for checking out this ku sports hour that was in fact over an hour i'm very proud of us yay We'll keep them coming uh, as soon as we figure it out and as soon as we can uh, make a better path for this podcast to be more consistent when Zach gets back from his vacation. Bon voyage. Congrats to Kansas and congrats to all of you hardworking fans out there. Enjoy every second.